You boys look like a weird heavy metal band. <laughs> yes, we are a band. Really? Yeah. So what do you play? Symphonic, post-apocalyptic, reindeer grinding, Christ abusing, extreme war, pagan, fennoscandic metal. Right. Really interesting. <laughs> What up, everyone? DJ Anubis. And DJ Neko. Here with you on the Meltdown Radio Podcast, doing another movie review. This time we're doing Velvet Goldmine 1998. You just saw a video from that uh, movie. It's directed by Todd Haynes. The cast consists of Ewan McGregor as Kurt Wilde, Jonathan Rise Myers as Brian Slade, Christian Bale as Arthur Stewart, Tony Collette is Mandy Slade and Eddie Izzard as Jerry Devine. Plot is London 1971, flower power is on the wane, and floundering hippie troubadour Brian Slade feels old fashioned and out of step until he experiences the raw power of rock musician exhibitionist uh, Kurt Wilde at a live concert. Smitten and inspired, Slade rises from the ashes of fussy brocade, reincarnated as the ambiguous pop rock god Des of. Platinum Dust and Phoenix Feathers, Maxwell Demon. His alluring, androgynous imagery and the seductive sounds his glitter rocks seduce teenagers across the world, offering refuge for the weird and unwanted with the promise of everything goes hedonism. At the height of his fame and cultural influence, he plots his sensational demise to escape alienating his fans and falling into obscurity. On the 10th anniversary of the character assassination, journalist Arthur Stewart investigates Slade's disappearance, forcing him to revisit his own confusing teenage identity crisis and rebirth, mirroring that of his idol, Brian Slade. Currently, the film had uh, on Rotten Tomatoes a score of 62% for the critics, which is considered uh, fresh, and the audience 80%, which is kind of surprising, but it's pretty good for that film. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a little film that has escaped my purview for so long you've seen it but yeah, i saw it like about five years ago it was either on netflix or something i just kind of watched it on the whim and while most of the time the sexual content wouldn't be something that i would necessarily care about or want to watch it, it really isn't like the focal i mean it's in there but it's not really the focal one because i do enjoy the music the music's big uh i know who these actors are portraying like they're paralleling david bowie and iggy, iggy pop, pop with yeah. their modeled after so i knew by watching it what they were going for and it, it, interestingly enough bowie vetoed the proposal at the time that his songs appear in the film so he didn't want any of his music so he had like a kind of an issue with it i think i think he thought it might have been maybe mocking or um like playing to him yeah 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 i i understand yeah i understand where he came from but the first thing that kind of like i i recognize reminded me of uh, Queen of the Damned, where most of the music is original. Yeah. And if you don't know that about Queen of the Damned, the movie and this movie, the the music was created. The the songs were created for the bands in the movie. And I, I asked DJ Anubis, I'm like, the I mean, Baby on Babies on Fire is is a cover, but like everything else is original. Mm -hmm. and created by like you know superstar musicians it's kind of similar to queen of the damned where it was uh jonathan davis did <clears throat> excuse me most of the music there Raymond was on there mm -hmm. from disturbed yeah uh, yeah there's a lot of good music on that soundtrack i um, think obviously as we said myers was his character brian slade is mimicked after uh david bowie uh mcgregor of course with iggy pop but it was kind of funny because because this was late 90s 
I kind and of it's, saw, it's it's taking place early seventies to early eighties. But I, I saw his kind of character, and even though the punkish part of it reminds me of Pop, his look in the video there reminds me of like Kurt Cobain at, because of that alternative style uh, at the time. Well, later in the in the movie, you are hitting on early nineties, mm -hmm. so it, it does kind of pull that as well. Um, what I found so interesting was. Um, Actually, Christian Bale, your boyfriend's character, um, you have to think back. This is the early 70s and, you know, being different, even the hippie flower power stuff was wrong. And um, yeah, it was interesting because at one point Slade, when we, when we talk about his beginnings in the music scene, he's about the flower power. He was in a dress. He was on stage playing acoustic. Kind of yeah. Like he's doing, songs. yeah. He's doing very, like, and the audiences stuff. weren't really responding to it. Like they didn't really care about it that much. And it's kind of like when he comes back off and he's watching Kurt, Kurt Wild, Wild. Up there with the rats and it's all the punk. He's yeah. And he, he rips and his stuff. pants off and is like flinging his dick around. Yeah. Like, and so it's kind of like he was, you know, Kurt was showing him that even if the him. audience doesn't like him, he's just going to say, fuck you and do what he wants. I think Brian at that point, that's what kind of clicked in his head. It's like they loved him, even though they hated him. It's like they just. That's exactly what it was, because yeah. they were appalled by <laughs> his his stage presence. But they no. So he so Brian went on. And it was nice and it was melodic and it was thoughtful. And then Kurt goes on and it's fucking like a cocaine dream. It's insane. Kurt rips off his pants. He's singing. He's flipping around on the stage. And it's not stuff. And he ends up kind of like unraveling uh, a, a mystery towards the end uh, that you know, finds out who, where Brian Slade actually ended up. He, he chases down uh, Kurt Wilde, talks to him. They actually met prior when Yeah, they were because younger. he was at that, that concert and kind of like, again, Kurt Wilde is his idol. So is Brian Slade. And he's at this concert and he's a young man, maybe 21 he's just escaped his parents. His parents do not accept the fact that he is gay or bisexual. He goes, he left, he went to Germany. He's done. He wants to be in the scene and he gets in the scene and he's with Kurt Wilde, like romantically. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that really um, shows through with Christian Bale, like discovering who he is, because when you, um, look at future Christian Bale, you don't see this like immature kind of like very scene reserved. kid. You see a very serious reporter. And if you look back, you know, at the clips that you just played where he's putting on the eyeliner and he's giggling and he's putting in the, the hair makeup and stuff, he just wants to be part of the scene because he's not really sure where he belongs and that's one thing i really appreciate about the way christian bale acts is because this is the same person in the same movie who's taking like a 10-year difference but also taking a 10-year journey from a young you know early 20s scene kid to a journalist yeah. a, a serious journalist who actually has accolades through his job and you know at first when they were talking about we want you to cover the brian slade story he's like what because i'm the resident brit and they're like no because you were there so knowing that he had the scene Past image, history, yeah. yeah they wanted to take that and use that for his professional life too and i really love the part where he finds Kurt Wilde and they're just chit chatting. This is future state. So it's like 84, what 84? Yeah. That's yeah. Right, yeah. So he's chit chatting with Kurt Wilde and he's like, Oh, you were at the, the concert. And he's like, yeah, I was at the concert and they just were chit chatting, but 
there was a brooch that apparently Brian Slade had given to Kurt Wilde and saying it belonged to Oscar Wilde, hence the Oscar Wilde. And um, Kurt had kept it for so long because he treasured it from Brian Slade. Now, I don't think Kurt Wilde really remembered um, Arthur. No, yeah, I don't think he I did. don't think he did. Because you have to understand, Kurt Wilde was into a lot of drugs. Uh, and a lot of men yeah. and women. And yeah. the, so he had this brooch and Arthur had made a comment about the brooch and Kurt had kind of giggled and said it belonged to, I, I got this from a friend. He said it belonged to Oscar Wilde and they just kind of giggled about it. But the the tonality of it and the way that like his face changed. So like Christian Bale is there being like an adult mm -hmm. just chit chatting with Kurt Wilde. And then they start talking about the brooch and he turns into like fanboy and like the transformation of the face in that second makes you realize like, even when he's been through this and he was in the scene and he's still confronted with someone who he had a romantic interaction with, he's still smitten. Yeah, I like that. I like the fact you brought that up about his transformation because each character uh, between the three of them each had nice development. Like it, the movie's not massively long, but you do get a clear sense of each character and the growth they go through, and it's each differently done differently. So uh, that is a good uh, observation on your part. Um, now, I will say we're going to get towards the end of the review. So if you don't want spoilers, even though this movie's been out forever, I am going to give spoilers with her here. So if you don't really want to know them, go ahead and just stop here and then you can come back later. But for the rest of you, um, obviously, as Arthur Stewart's investigating all this, we find out that right now, I think it's still 84. So we have a new pop sensation named Tommy Stone. And his manager is the chick, not Mandy Slade, but another chick that was kind it of was, it was a later chick that, towards the end of Brian. Yeah, Slade's Brian career. was with this other chick who was infatuated right, with, with him. him. And she hung around. And I remember when Mandy and Brian were divorcing that one scene where she was just kind of like, don't make a scene, Mandy, like just kind of being real bitchy to her yeah. and Brian and like Mandy for a wife of someone, Mandy was pretty cool. Cause like uh -huh. Brian's fucking dudes, fucking other women, you know, doing lots of drugs and stuff. And I think like at one point Mandy was hitting her breaking point too. And she was just like, kind of like, why, why? And got really upset. And, um, this other chick, I can't remember her name in the movie either, but the one that I said that kind of looks like Jennifer Lawrence, who was obsessed with, um, Brian Slade, uh -huh. she somehow weasels her way into Brian's like entourage. And this is after the whole, like, he got shot thing and Brian's on his like own downward spiral with multiple chicks. Brian and Kurt for a while were collaborating and they were lovers too. And, and again, Mandy was, I don't know if she was hurt by it, but she was being cool about it. Mm -hmm. But then after that kind of fell out and then the whole, like Mandy said that, she didn't even know that it was a hoax. Like he didn't even tell her right. and she was heartbroken. It took her like a day to figure out that her own. She probably thought she was, he was dead. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people at that concert literally thought it was real. That was part of the, and nobody told her. And that was kind of like the downfall with her. And there was also like prior to that recent, like very recently before the whole hoax shooting was the breakup of Brian and Kurt too and i think there was some inferences in the movie that they broke up it didn't work out they were too passionate for each other but kurt was always kind of like there he was always just anytime he thought that brian would be around kurt 
wanted and we see that in that one concert that Gary Ferry did and that Kurt was was at as well that you saw Brian way 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 back with a hat and a trench coat he was there to watch they both kind of like always will love each other but they're both too big bright shining they're stuff. very they're bad for each other yeah like the mag so, the yeah. magnets like bounce off of each other yeah. kind of thing they're so the passion is there so the admiration will always be there and these are things that mandy as brian's wife is like completely understanding about but after the shoot the fake shooting and her not being told and then he just starts like the downward spiral yeah that's when the divorce happened and that's when it got like kind of ugly yeah because he kind of lost sight of everything else his, his wife and really the career he wasn't really taking this seriously anymore he was just kind of doing a lot of drugs and just kind of like wasting away mm -hmm. and that was kind of mm -hmm. pissing her off so and you know as a wife who is her super chill she knows the rock star life and she was very because she loved him mm -hmm. just very very chill i think the fake death and her having a whole day of like mourning and panic attacks and being so upset about him being dead and then it turns around and she was like he 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 didn't even tell me he was gonna do this and i had to go through that without anyone around me mm -hmm. i think that's what kind of like was her tipping point yeah you kind of saw like throughout the film as arthur is interviewing people like there was a lot of collateral damage that brian had along the way to stardom and mm -hmm. it cost him his marriage his old manager like it just was a lot of shit that fell to the wayside um, but it's interesting because what ends up happening is Tommy Stone is actually Brian Slade just reimagined. And in an interview with GQ at the time, uh, Jonathan Rise Myers criticized the decision to use a different actor to play Tommy Stone at the end of the film. He says it's very hard for the audience to get that, which I think I'm not quite sure. Did we make the right move there? I don't think they did. I, 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 I actually agree with him because I think. You could have done some makeup changes on him and, and made him, it look like he had a nose job or something. Right. And you, but you would still see like the eyes. You would still like their because it's not hard to put it together because you do have the chick there that's the new manager. So it, it, you figure it out pretty easily. But you, because the guy looks so different, you would think that he went through total reconstruction surgery. That's what how it looks. You should have like. But there should have been like semblance of Brian Slade in there. That's kind of what Jonathan Rise Myers is kind of getting at, I think. Because they were trying to make him more like a Van Halen or or like hair rock looking guy. But. It was a. It, it had no like air of Brian Slade. Right. So Tommy Stone and almost even his attitude looked, and everything was just really weird. He, he didn't have the manners and sound as this, as the other actor. And you you think about like people you know or people you've seen on stage or people you've seen on film or actors, musicians, etc. You look at old clips of them and then you look at current clips or you know clips that are 20 years down the road they are themselves they have a way about how they are so i i knew it was a different actor and maybe maybe they did that on purpose to really fuck with the audience to make it look so different but the story is that brian slade is tommy stone but if you it confused us both a little bit because we figured out that's it because author christian bale's character he was trying to figure out like he's like typing on old school yeah, he found like connections to tommy mm -hmm. stone that he said so, oh okay brian slade um his first name was tommy or Thomas mm -hmm. Brian um, Thomas, Stone yeah. something like Thomas Brian Stonehenge. Let's just pretend I forgot what it was. And when he went by Brian Slade, everybody just knew Brian Slade. So when he was like 
kind of doing research and he it like the light bulb went off he's like his first name is thomas and his last name is stonehenge that's the same person and he like figured it out if you're going to do that to the audience and say you know hello this is the big twist at the end at least make it feel more authentic than just some dude with a pompadour who kind of resembles mm -hmm. Brian Slade. Either that, or I was wondering if um, this is another alternate idea. Like maybe they were thinking that um, that Tommy Stone was like taking the identity of Slade. Slade. Yeah. That's a little bit more like deeper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> far fetched, deeper, whatever. Because the whole idea is all these people are interconnected, right? Like mm -hmm. they were all like they were all so involved emotionally and creatively that um, I do really wish they wouldn't have had a separate like you could have put some really, really fake hair in Tom. Uh, What's Jonathan, his yeah. Jonathan Reese Myers and um giving him some big lips and some a prosthetic nose. Yeah, he could have did anything. I mean, and you know, you would still made have him some, look fat, put a fat suit on or, or something. Anything, you know, but you know, that's the way they went. Um again, it's not super hard to not figure out what's going on, but I understand where Myers is coming from because it would make more sense to have the same actor mm -hmm. doing a different role than Especially if disguise. he's still being admired by by Kurt and by Arthur. And yeah, because Kurt figured it out. Kurt figured it out. And he had been following yeah. Tommy so Stone for that's a why he was while. I was surprised when Arthur had figured it out. He's like, oh, so you know. Yeah. So, what would you give the rank yeah, rating of this film out of 10? Uh, the music really helps. And Ewan McGregor's dick really helps. So, probably an eight. Good call. That's what I would give it. Um, I love the aesthetic. Um, it, it totally captures like the David Bowie and, and Iggy Pop. And isn't that what I said when I watched this? I was like, "Does this dude think he's he's David Bowie?" That was the first thing like that I was picking up on with the whole feathers and all the other stuff. And instead of red hair, he's got blue hair. You know. Yeah. Um, it's a good story. It is. Uh, it's it's you know it's not something that i see through a lot of other films of the same nature and it's it's a nice little plot device uh great acting you got a lot of great actors here you know in their early years so it's it's a lot of fun to kind of see that play out and it's something that um we were saying earlier when we were talking with our friends about other movies that even if Christian Bale and Ewan McGregor and Jonathan Rhys Myers are, they're not really gay per se with each other. They cared enough about the movie to put forth, like, it doesn't look cheesy. It doesn't look corny. It doesn't look forced. Oh, it looks all real. It legit. looks like they are all, like, again. And that's, that's a credit to acting, man. Like, if you, whether they're legitimately straight or not like i know they can be bisexual i don't really know their sexual preference but the reality is acting wise they they put everything into the roles like they didn't have any hesitation about kissing each other or whatever they just went all in and they did their thing like i'm telling you like christian bale looked like fanboy and then he looked like serious journalist yeah in a blink of an eye and i think that's that's a tribute to your boyfriend's great acting. Like, again, I am Ewan McGregor number one fangirl too. So, like, seeing him acting like this, surprising. Yeah. That's he, why I was like, when I was watching it, like, but I don't, then, I mean, I don't you think about, you really... think about like train spotting too. That was another surprising thing that Ewan McGregor. So, I mean, yeah it's 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 good stuff man heart like there's a lot of heart in it there's mm -hmm. a lot of like passion emotion it's well written mm -hmm. that that's what this movie is about like even if you if you are i hate to say this if you are scared of watching dudes like fall in love with each other then don't watch this movie because these are dudes 
who it won't be for everybody. Yeah, he they are a lot of sexual content. I mean, it's not it's, it's not, not meant for explicit, kids, but it, you know what's going on. It's not hard to tell. But like these dudes, they it's it's love and appreciation, and they do it. Break, break breaking boundaries, basically. Yeah. This film is like. So that's why probably one reason why you didn't hear too much about it because at the time ninety eight, this is ninety eight, yeah, really talking about that too. I much. mean, this is this film, but this film is very relevant for today, really. If you want to think about it in terms of a lot of what's going on in the LBTG community and all that stuff, so you know. Anyway, if you've seen this film, drop down in the comments. Let us know what you thought. Uh, if you have any interest in it, let us all know as well. I do. Yep, it's good stuff. And uh, yeah, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. And, 100 uh, likes, I go topless. Have we gotten 100 likes yet? We'll see you next time here on the Metal Town Radio Podcast. Appreciate your support. You're